How are you guys doing this evening? Good, good. You guys have your Bibles if you'd like to turn to John chapter 4. Um, I haven't been up here since staff introduction, but just kind of reminder, my name's Nicholas, and I'm one of your campus ministers, and so excited to be here today to bring God's Word. Um, if you guys have your Bibles, or if they're on the version, you guys can follow along in the app, John chapter 4. Um, when we go in there, we'll read the text in full, starting in verse 1. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you were right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. Which you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with the woman, but no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? The woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you've entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, but we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. And I just pray that tonight as I bring it, uh, that you give me accuracy and clarity of thought, Lord, um, not to say anything that you would not have me to say. Help me present the true meaning of this passage clearly and for the benefit of the souls in this room. And I pray this in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. Um, so through the Gospel of John, we've kind of broken up in several series, the first one being people with Jesus. And so last week, Shandy taught on the story of Nicodemus and Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. And so here we have Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And Jesus encounters different people in different ways, reaching them where they are at. But nonetheless, the message remains the same. And the topic is the gift of God, what Jesus is offering to Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. These are vastly different people, but yet he offers the same gift. He has come into the world to save the world by a sacrifice for their sins so they may be right with God. But I want to notice the striking differences between Nicodemus and the woman of Samaria Uh, Before we dive into the passage, notice that Nicodemus, he's a man. 
Samaritan is a woman. It was he's a Jew. She is a Samaritan. He's a religious leader. She's an adulteress. He sought Jesus. Jesus sought her. His was a private conversation at night. Hers was rather public at a well. He comes with the view of Jewish theology. She comes with the view of Samaritan theology. The people are different. Jesus' approach is very different. But the message is the same. The gift is the same. What we're kind of going to see is that with Nicodemus, Jesus centers on this topic of spiritual rebirth. Here we're going to see the topic of spiritual worship, which can kind of result from that. But what, the way I want to kind of, was going to break down this passage, there's so many ways to do it, and I think we're going to focus on the gift of God, and we're going to unpack what it is that Jesus is offering to Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman. What is it, is it that he's offering? And just like Shandy talked about last week, uh, the obstacles to Jesus, so we are also going to kind of touch upon a little bit of those obstacles as well that keeps us from receiving the gift of God that is offered by Jesus Christ. So what is the gift of God? Number one, the gift of God is spiritual. In verses 7 through 15, notice that Jesus goes to the woman and asks, give me a drink. The Samaritan woman puts up two barriers. She says, hold on, you're, you're a man and you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan and a woman. What are you asking me for a drink of water? And Jesus further explains, he says, well, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus explains that if she really knew who he really was, God incarnate, then social barriers would be irrelevant. So notice that with Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman, he's bypassing social barriers because he's God, he's above that. So Jesus offers this gift, this gift of living water, which the woman, perhaps humoring Jesus, asks about how she can obtain the water. Sometimes it's hard to know, is she really literally interpreting Jesus or is she really think? Or is she kind of humoring Jesus, you know, kind of like, oh, you, here's this Jew coming here trying to be high and mighty, telling me as a Samaritan that he's got the gift of God and yada, yada, yada. But it's interesting because she, she points out and she says, do you, you have nothing to draw water with? And she wasn't about to let him use her bucket because there was, a, there was a very massive segregation between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Jews believed that they were to use the Samaritan's bucket, that they'd be defiled. If you remember the Samaritans, Back in the Old Testament, intermarried with foreign nations, and so they were not pure-blooded Jews. And they were associated with having fallen into idolatry back in the Old Testament, and so the Jews really hated the Samaritans. They, in fact, would go around their country to get to other parts of Israel just to stay away from them. But Jesus decides to take the route to there. He goes to the Samaritans. So he offers this gift, and she puts up this, these two social barriers, and then he offers this gift from God. And she's like, do you really think that you're greater? Like, she says, are you greater than our father Jacob? Where is this living water that you give? And it's kind of ironic because she, she says, are you greater than Jacob? And back in the Old Testament, sometimes God would be referred to as the God of Jacob or the God of Abraham. And, you know, for the longest time, I always wondered why those two names were associated with God or why these names were paired with God. And that was because it was to show the covenant relationship he had with the people of Israel. It was to show they had a covenant relationship. They had an encounter with God, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob. And so they had a relationship with God. That was what it signified, a covenant relationship. And so she asked, are you greater than Jacob who gave us this well, who, who God has blessed through him for us? And it's kind of ironic because, yes, he is greater than Jacob. He's about the closest in the Trinitarian relationship, like Nathaniel brought up in chapter 1 a couple of weeks ago. Jesus is greater than Jacob. So maybe she's interpreting Jesus literally, or maybe she's amusing him. But Jesus explains the living water is to be something, it's something more than just a physical water. Jesus is using it as an analogy. He's speaking about a spiritual reality. You know those people who take things like way too literally? Have you ever had people like that? I've had encounters like that, um, especially if you go to college at the Ozarks. Um, everyone takes everything super literally there. <laughs> one guy was, uh, was with my brother and some of his friends, and this one guy was joking around about how he got pulled over by a cop, and he was kind of joking with the cop. And this other guy, super serious, this dead serious, says, you cannot joke with a cop. <laughs> they take things seriously. They will, they, will, they will pull a gun. You have to be careful. It's, I'm serious. Like, you got to be careful. And we were just like, dude, it's just a joke. You know? He's not being literal. <laughs> and, but it's sometimes kind of aggravating when you have people like, you can't really you know, banter or have a conversation because they just take things super literal. 
Maybe that's some of you guys. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyhow, I think this is kind of what the Samaritan woman's doing. With Nicodemus even, you know, when Shandy was teaching last night, I mean, last week, Nicodemus is like, wait, you got to be spiritual rebirth? Like, you entered your mom's womb a second time? And I'm sure Jesus is like, oh, no, it's, it's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm explaining a spiritual reality. And so I think we need to remember the gift of God is spiritual. A lot of people forget that nowadays, especially with the prosperity gospel of today's age. Sometimes we want to think that the gift of God is something physical. She even asked, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. You know, she, maybe she's playing into it, maybe she's amusing, but she's not getting what Jesus is trying to get across. Jesus is talking about something spiritual, something deeper than just the physical elements in this real world. And sometimes we mistake God's gift you know, when you, when you put up a prayer request, you know, how many times do we hear people pray about physical circumstances, but we never talk about the deep spiritual problems that we struggle with, like sin. We're trying to know Christ more and more in a deeper relationship. Sometimes we think God's gift is a fix for our short physical circumstances in this life, whether it's good grades, romantic relationship, trying to get someone to admit they're wrong, a sickness, difficult day, busy schedules, pressuring responsibilities, Trying to acquire more stuff, get more vacation time, more free time, more friends, more social approval. We sometimes think of God's gift in terms of materialistic fulfillments or concrete flesh and blood realities. But we don't really realize that the gift of God is aiming at something spiritual. And that's what God's trying to get across to the Samaritan woman. We tend to forget that the real problem with man is not just a physical reality or circumstance, but a spiritual reality of separation from God himself as man's ultimate problem. So furthermore, what is this living water? What is this gift that God provides? Verses 13 through 15, point number two, the gift of God is fulfilling. The gift of God is fulfilling. He says here in verse 13, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Notice the words he uses, the sense of this thirsting. When you thirst, you think of something you lack, that you, you're longing, you're desiring something. You thirst for contentment, completion, fulfillment, all which Christ claims can be found in him. That's what he's claiming. It's a bold claim. Thirst no more, he says. He says, you will never be thirsty again. He's not talking about something that's physical. He's not talking about, if, you, if you've seen Pirates of the Caribbean, I think it's the fourth one out of 20 of them, I don't know. But they go to the fountain of youth and they drink the water and they live forever. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the Holy Grail from Indiana Jones. He's talking about a spiritual thirst, okay? One that you will can be truly fulfilled. I don't think it's hard to say that man longs for things. Human beings long for things all the time. It's what drives us, it's what motivates us. It is the essence of our desires. We long to be known, so we beef up our social media profiles. We long to be smart, so we study and study. We long to be the best athlete, so we train and practice. We long to look good, so we eat healthy and work out. We long to be romanticized, so we search out potential interests. We long to feel content, so we stock up our Amazon cart. We long to be part of something, so we join a club, a movement, a gang. What we do is spurred by longings. <clears throat> Most of the time, they're not godly longings. They're sinful longings. Just as James 4, 1 through 3 says, What causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. I think it's safe to say that we all have these deep longings in us. Some sinful, maybe some fine. I think of Psalm 34.8 when when Jesus is talking about this. uh, The psalm says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The sense of thirsting and longing. The desire and longing to be close to God is the only possible desire that can be fulfilled and satisfied. Have you ever thought about that? Nothing else will satisfy you. Your desire for fame will never be fulfilled. Your desire for lust will never be fulfilled. Your desire for power will never be fulfilled. Your desire for God can be fulfilled. That longing can be fulfilled. Every other desire at its best can promise fleeting, partial fulfillment. That's it. Do you believe that the gift of God can fully satisfy you? 
in the end? Is it worth receiving and pursuing the rest of your life as a follower of Christ? We can believe the lie that sinful desires and passions can be fulfilled when in actuality we need to be spiritually reborn, in hint John 3, with a new longing and passion for God, which can be fulfilled. Selfish desires rob us of joy in God. We'll never feel fulfilled. And that's why we need spiritual rebirth. That's kind of how this is coming off the hill. Spiritual worship coming out of spiritual rebirth. It's talked about in John, John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. And the obstacle to that is self, selfish desires, selfish passions. Just like Shandy was teaching last week, the obstacle of self can get in the way of you receiving the gift of God. So the gift of God is spiritual, the gift of God is fulfilling, and thirdly, the gift of God is revealing. I like how that rhymes. Yeah. 16 through 18. This woman obviously isn't getting Jesus' drift. She's not catching on. And so Jesus decides to employ a supernatural miracle to show her <clears throat> that this is pertinent. She thinks, oh, you know, whatever. You're talking about this spiritual gift. She's not taking Jesus seriously. She's trying to divert him. He's a Jew. She doesn't really want to talk to him anymore. So she's just kind of playing around with him. Oh, give me this water, and I'll you know, never be thirsty or whatever. And Jesus says, okay, go, go call your cousin, husband and come here. She's like, I have no husband. And he says, you're right. The man you're with isn't your husband, but you've had five husbands. Jesus is trying to show that she needs this gift more than she lets on. It's revealing. The gift of God is a revealing thing. When it's offered, when Jesus offered the gift, he was telling them, you have a spiritual problem, and I can solve it. This is what the gift is meant to be. Jesus is showing that she needs this more than she lets on. So she tries to divert the question, but he reveals something deep. You so the gift of God is fulfilling, right? That's what he explained here in verse 13. <clears throat> the woman kind of ignores that, saying, well, give me this water so I'll never thirst again. And Jesus shows, you really do have a longing. You really do, you do have a problem. Your greatest need is reconciliation with me. That's your greatest need. She's been with five men, and she's with the sixth one right now. Don't you think that she's probably looking for something? Isn't she longing for something? And she's trying to find it in something of sinful passions and desires. And Jesus is trying to say, you don't have to thirst anymore. You don't have to long anymore. You don't have to chase after these things. Your greatest need, what you really need as a gift, is a right relationship with me. That's what you need. That's what will satisfy you. This living water, thirst no more. The gift of God is revealing I'm trying to see how we explain it because in the same way, when we receive the gift of God, we also have to, in a sense, admit we're wrong. And that's the obstacle of pride, like Shandy was talking about last week with Nicodemus, the obstacle of pride. Because, you know, like a good example is, let's say, I've kind of used this before, um, but I'm going to use it again, a kind of a variation of it. But let's say Nathaniel went to Bass Pro Shops and bought a really nice bait casting rod. And if you know Nathaniel, he loves fishing. He's really into it. Um, he's a master fisherman. So he goes, he buys this rod, and I don't know, I get mad at him for some reason, and I just snap his rod in half, you know. <laughs> and yeah, I'd probably get fired. <laughs> that, that wouldn't go over well. So I snap his rod in half, and, you know, later on, I feel really bad, and I feel like, oh. And, and so I go to Nathaniel because I want his forgiveness, right? I go to Nathaniel because I want to receive the gift of forgiveness. So again, I want to go to Nathaniel to receive the gift of forgiveness. To get the gift of forgiveness, though, in the same breath means I'm also admitting I'm wrong. Okay, so if he gives me that gift of forgiveness and I receive it, I'm in a sense saying I needed it, right? If I was going to have a right relationship with Nathaniel, we were going to continue on and be able to fish again together or do something, I had to be right with him, and I needed that gift. The same thing is with God, with Jesus Christ. He offers this gift, but the reason why most of us sometimes struggle to receive it, or maybe you haven't received it yet, is because the obstacle of pride doesn't want you to. This woman doesn't even, she brings up a theological debate. Just bold face doesn't even acknowledge what Jesus says. Just notice it. Like, you're just like, wow, he, he just completely revealed in a public area at a well that she was pretty much committing adultery. That's a big deal back then. That was a really big deal back then. And the woman just brings up, Jesus says, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Brings up a theological debate. 
And this is where we get to point number four, which is 19 through 26, that the gift of God is a person. The gift of God is Jesus Christ. So the woman poses a theological debate, trying to divert any attention to her personal life. So she brings up the elephant in the room. You've got to think of the Jew and the Samaritans. They had this big, long-standing debate of where they ought to worship. The Samaritans only believed in the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. Okay? They did not believe in the Proverbs, the Psalms, or the Prophets. The Jews, on the other hand, did. And so it was derived from their text that they ought to worship on Mount Gerizim, which I think I'm pronouncing it right, while the Jews believed you ought to worship in Jerusalem. Okay? So have you ever been like, at a family outing and maybe you guys have like political differences with some extended family or religious differences, and you're kind of all there, and you know that if you just say a single word or you bring up a single topic, it's going to start a big debate. I've been in situations like that. You're just like, just stay away. Those words are taboo. We don't want to get into that. Well, this is kind of the thing. The woman and Jesus, we, they both know their difference of theology, their difference of belief, and so to divert any attention to her sin, she's like, well, we'll just talk about this theological debate. Like, we're all here we all know that we believe differently. So tell me, you're a prophet. Obviously, you can tell, you know, everything about me. So tell me, do we worship on this mountain or do we worship in Jerusalem? And Jesus completely disregards that in many ways. He does give a caveat later on in this discourse, but he does say, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. She talks about our Father's worship. Jesus says, no, let's talk about the Father. Now, your forefathers, let's talk about the Father. Because worship is not supposed to be so focused on the location. It's supposed to be focused on the person of Jesus Christ, on Father. And he explains what true worship is, true worship that derives from a true spiritual rebirth, a change of heart. It's a worship in spirit, meaning the man's heart. Okay? It's in the heart. It's spiritual. It's deep. And it's truth. It's sincere. It's genuine. It's a longing and desire fulfilled in God Worshiping God and obedience and following of him. And it's, it's in the heart, and it's genuine and sincere, and it's a right knowledge of who God is. It's a right knowledge. It's truth. True worship focuses on a person, not a place. It focuses on the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus explains. He does give a caveat. He says, understand, though, that your, your Jewish theology is more in line than your theology because you deny parts of the scripture. And he says that from the Jews will come the Messiah, which is him. So he does give her that caveat, and he explains out of the scriptures. Like we read Ezekiel 37, 26 through 28, we get a really good indication of what it means how worship is not a place, but a state of being. It says in Ezekiel 37, 26 through 28, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will set them in their land and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel, and my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Notice that the sanctuary is in their midst. Two times he says that. And the, and the first time he says sanctuary in their midst forevermore. I mean, the place of worship is in their hearts. So spiritual rebirth, as talked about in John 3, to translate into spiritual worship, a longing and fulfilling uh, for Jesus Christ, satisfied in him. And I think about this when it comes to the person of Jesus Christ and when it comes to dealing with the sin in our lives and the gift of God. It is a lot easier okay, to talk about weighty theological concepts or philosophical to- topics than it is to get personal, to talk about how it applies. It's easier to talk about the doctrines without ever letting those truths deal with your own personal life. Just like Shane, you brought up last week, the obstacle of religion. The same thing this woman's bringing up. Let's talk about this theological concept. I don't want to talk about my personal life. I don't want to talk about how how you're coming in and being invasive about my own life and my own struggles. But Jesus wants to meet us where we're at. When it gets personal, we run away. We tend to run away. So the woman tried to make it a matter of religion, but Jesus explains it's not going to be about the location. It's about your heart. I mean, think about it. She's like, so what do we worship? And he's like, well, it's really a matter of the heart and um, whether or not you really desire me or not. And it's about worshiping a spirit and truth. And she's like, probably like, oh, that goes right back <laughs> to my sinful lifestyle. It goes right back to it. But Jesus is trying to show her. And notice how gentle and loving he is in this whole conversation. He's very patient. This woman's probably very fiery in the way that she's, her responses have been very rapid fire and very diverting. 
What does a Jew like him have to do with a Samaritan like her? But he's, he's being patient. He's wanting to offer this gift. It is a gift. And I think we have to be careful. I think one of the biggest struggles is that when it comes to Christianity, we lose Christ a lot of the times. Uh, there was a lot of students I've asked the, uh, two questions, um, one of them being, how did you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And the second question, why do you continue to follow? Nine times out of ten, their first answer is, I grew up in church. Sometimes they won't even talk about the person of Jesus Christ. And it is a concern. Since have we forgot in some ways maybe that the focus should be on Christ? It's not a sense of condemning when I say that. It's a sense of, I don't, I don't want to lose sight of the gift of God who is Christ. We don't want to lose sight of that. Or have we lost our wonder and awe and joy who Christ is and have we made it matters of religion? Have we made it about ourselves? Are we diverting when God comes to us and he convicts us and says, have you really, do you really know me? And we just divert it. We maybe make it a matter of, well, Jesus, you haven't answered these physical prayers yet about my grades or my major or my romantic relationship. Or maybe we're like, well, what about religion? Let's talk about that. That's easier. But we can't forget, you know, when we sang that song, The Old Rugged Cross, that's the central part of what we believe. Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. He can truly satisfy. So the gift of God is Christ himself. The gift of God reveals our need for Christ. It's fulfilling and it's a spiritual need. It's a spiritual need that we have, have to have. And that brings to point number five. The gift of God is here and now. The gift of God is here and now. Verses 27 <clears throat> to 37. Well, we'll actually start back in 20, verse 25. The woman said to him, I know. This is kind of her last resort to kind of quell the conversation. I know the Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus says, I who you speak to am he. Notice she says, when? And Jesus is like, no, it's now. I'm now. The gift of God is here. I am the Messiah. <clears throat> the disciples come back and they, they see Jesus talking with the woman. They don't ask. They know that he probably has his good reasons. So the woman left her water jar and she goes on. And the disciples, they come back and they bring food and they're like, Rabbi, eat. And, and Jesus says, I have food to eat about that you do not know about. And once again, we're kind of back to the whole literalistic interpretations of, you know, Nicodemus thinking you're being literally spiritually reborn, the woman thinking it's literal water, and now the disciples are like, where did you get this food? You know, we walked like five miles to get it. And like, I don't see a fast food right, joint around here. Like, how did he get this food? And so it's kind of hilarious because they're like, Jesus is like, I have food to eat that you do not know about. He's speaking a profound truth, and the disciples are like, man, did he, where did he get the bread? You know, where did he eat? And it's Jesus like, <laughs> probably like, oh my goodness, the patience that he shows. And he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. We kind of go back to that food. In Matthew chapter 5, it says, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Once again, Jesus is saying, my food, my satisfaction comes from my relationship with God, my right relationship with God. That's his satisfaction. So he's kind of talking, kind of paralleling back what he said to the woman that thirst, you know, if you drink of this living water, your right relationship with God found in me a reconciliation, an eradication of your sin, a spiritual rebirth, leading to spiritual worship is what will satisfy you. So he makes it a lesson. And it's here and now. People are being saved. The Samaritans are, are starting to believe. And Jesus is like, don't you see the gift of God is here and now? You're caught up with these physical circumstances and problems, but don't you see? I've come into the world to redeem the world. The gift, the gift of God, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He is the gift of God, and it's now here. And the disciples are having a hard time realizing it. Do we have a hard time realizing it? Do we rejoice when people are saved? Do we rejoice in the gift of God? I mean, we, we, we rejoice when, you know, we, we see a fireman or someone save someone's life or an EMT bring someone back from the dead. We rejoice in real-life heroes saving people's physical lives. What about eternity, though? That's for maybe another 70 years of life. We're talking about eternity. 
That's what the gift of God is doing. Jesus is coming and saving people's lives. Have we become dull to that gift or that salvation? Have we maybe become too cynical towards it? I know sometimes I hear about uh, salvation or someone being baptized, and I think, oh, that's cool. I'm like, but hold on. Someone has a restored relationship with God. The deepest problem of mankind is the need for a right relationship with God. That's what they need. That's what we all need. That's what the Bible claims. And that's, that's not my, what I'm saying. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says your deepest, your deepest needs to be right with God, to have reconciliation. If we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that goes into the ministry of reconciliation. And that is exactly what this word of God here. That's why I'm up here preaching. That's what we desperately need. The enemy does not want you to see the harvest. He does not want you to collect the harvest. And he certainly does not want you to rejoice in the harvest. Let me say that again. He does not want you to see the harvest. He doesn't want you to recognize the salvation and and the, the day of the Lord has come and is offering salvation a right relationship with God. He doesn't want you to collect. He doesn't want you to go out there and give the good news. He doesn't want you to spread it. He doesn't want you to evangelize. Okay, He's going to do everything he can to keep you from doing that. And thirdly, he doesn't want you to rejoice. He wants you to be miserable. Because then nobody, wants, nobody will know about this great gift that's happening. I think about in the Roman times, if you guys have seen the gladiator, you'll kind of remember this, but um, some of the emperors back in that time, in order to pursue their own political agendas, would try to distract the rich and the poor. And so they would... Uh, create uh, temple prostitutes, prostitution. They would have lavish feasts, and they'd have the gladiatorial games. And so they would distract people as they pursue their political agendas, give the people what they want. They don't care what we do up here in, in, our, in our rulership and everything, and we'll pursue what we want. And that's what the enemy wants. He wants you to be entertained. He wants you to be miserable. Whatever it is, whatever it is, he wants you to be distracted from the gift of God. By the physical circumstances, perhaps, that are happening here now. But number six, point number six. So the gift of God is it's here and now. Number six, the gift of God is inclusive. Verses 39 through 42. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. We have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is is indeed the Savior of the world. The gift of God is for everyone. It wasn't just for the Jews. It wasn't just for Nicodemus. And we see that major contrast from Jesus talking to Nicodemus to now talking to the Samaritan woman. The gift of God is Jesus Christ, revealing our need for him. He can fulfill us. It can fix our spiritual need and problem. It's here and now. And when Jesus sent the disciples on the Great Commission, he sent us out. He sent them out. It's, 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 it's meant for us today, and it's meant for everyone. The gift of God is for everyone of every background, color, gender, language, race, career path, location, country, demographic, you name it. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Think of that, for God so loved the world. He didn't have to. He gave his only begotten son that we can have a right relationship with God and be truly satisfied, truly fulfilled. We won't have to thirst anymore. So the question is, what will you do with that gift? If you've received it, are you, do you not see the harvest? Are you not going out and collecting the harvest? Are you not rejoicing in it? If so, then maybe you need to stop and, and come to Christ and be like, I've kind of forgotten that joy of knowing you. If you've never received the gift, it's here for you. Everyone. It's for everyone. Will you receive it, though? Will you receive it? And I can only say what Psalm 34, 8 says, that come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Take refuge in him. Matthew chapter 5. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word and um, the message of reconciliation and the gift. Um, Help us not to be blind to that reality and to the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that you would open our eyes, open everyone else's eyes in this room, Lord, that they may see it. Um, 
and that they would cherish it, rejoice in it. I pray that we would go out, Lord, and spread those good news, good news that we have been reconciled to you through your son, Jesus Christ. I pray this in your glorious son's name, Jesus Christ.